host of the Abstract Podcast, and we are joined today by Sean Buxton, Director of Sales Enablement at Acoustic. Sean, please take a moment and say hi. Hey, everybody. Excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. We're excited to have you, Sean. So before we uh, kind of dive into some of our, our talking points, and our questions today, um, it always helps to give our listeners a little bit of background on kind of how you got to where you are in your career. I think one of the best parts about working in tech is that no one goes to college and goes, I'm going to go work in tech. Specifically, I'm going to go work in sales in tech. And so kind of give us the Cliff Notes version of, of how Sean got to you, Director of Sales Enablement at Acoustic. Okay, I'll give you the short version because I might be older than a, a few of your listeners. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I actually went to to college uh, to be a pastor. And uh, after college, uh, graduated, went to my first pastor role. And I was like, wow, I really don't like doing this. <laughs> I'm like, that's, that's unfortunate. <laughs> Um, so anyway, I, I didn't have any problem with the man upstairs, but it, the job itself was not what, uh, what I thought it was going to be, but I learned a lot of, I learned a lot of skills that I'm, a, that I was able to parlay into the sales world. You know, I was basically selling, uh, something that you couldn't see that you couldn't touch. You couldn't, you couldn't feel, you know, but, I, but you got to change your whole life to get it. Right. Yeah. And so, um, it was pretty easy actually for me to transition into the sales world and, uh, as long as I could sell a product ethically, uh, you know, I was all about it. And so over the last 20 years or so, I've either been selling things as an individual contributor, leading sales teams or coaching sales leaders and sellers. And, and I typically will sell, you know, for three to five years and then take some time off and go do enablement. And then I come back and sell and do enablement and come back and sell. And I, I like to keep going back and forth because it keeps the, you know, the ax sharp. And I know if I stand up in front of an enablement audience that I have credibility because I've done it. And uh, I, I tell people, I'm not one of these enablement people that uh, talks about it because they can't do it. I'm a sales guy first, enablement guy second, and uh, yeah. just lo love selling. And so that's the short version. I'll, I'll leave out all the mistakes and, and failures. <laughs> well, there's uh, some interesting things to dive into there. And I'll, I'll first begin by saying, I... Um, I've known a lot of sales enablement folks over the past eight years in, in tech sales. And the ones that are successful are the ones that were successful in sales and realized they enjoyed helping, enabling, teaching, coaching more than selling. Um, they weren't the ones that failed their way into yeah. enablement. Yeah. And so I, I think you're there, you're spot on with kind of sharpening your ax because so much changes specifically in the world of like how technology enables sales, that how do you know how it's impacting salespeople on the front line if you're not doing it every single day, right? Yeah, absolutely. And you guys are a great example of that, what you're doing there at Abstract with, you know, you're on the cutting edge of what's happening in a new generation of technology that people never had access to before. So it's exciting. Yeah. Well, let's dive into the second thing, pasture to director of sales enablement at a tech company. So I instantly like that sounds maybe kind of like a, a sharp diversion in career choices, but I almost think there's a lot of similarities there in terms of um, you got to get people to buy into your vision. You're selling something that's not tangible. Mm -hmm. um, you are often standing up in front of a bunch of people trying to clearly articulate a methodology, thought process, um, use cases as they apply to their lives in sales. So I actually think that there's there's a lot of similarities probably in what makes up a successful pastor and a director of sales enablement or sales leader in tech in general. Yeah, it, it's interesting. Before I ever spoke at any conferences or whatever, I had already preached in churches to a thousand people before. So I was comfortable doing that, getting on stage and speaking at an SKO. Uh, it was just a, a different topic and different audience, but it was still, you know, a big room full of people. So I feel like it really prepared me for that. But, but more than anything, I feel like uh, studying to be a pastor, it prepared me in the way that I, I knew I needed to connect with people and treat people as human beings, right? And understand that we're all, we're all flawed and making mistakes and people need help to get to the next level. And to me, that's what leadership really is. When we talk about sales leadership and enabling sales leaders, which is my favorite thing to do now, you know, I define leadership as helping people get somewhere they could never get on their own. 
It's not yeah. getting people somewhere they can never get on their own. It's a partnership. It's helping people get somewhere they could never get on their own. And uh, yeah, I think that that definition probably comes from, you know, my early, my early years and uh, the initial path I thought I was going to take. Yeah. Well, I hate public speaking, um, <laughs> which is why I gravitated towards being able to sit behind a computer and sell software all day. So maybe after I try this whole software company thing, I'll go back and be a pastor for a couple of years. There and, you go. Uh, groom my skills for public speaking a little bit better. <laughs> um, well, let's dive into some of our questions. Um, so you have your day job, but there's also kind of something that you're trying to do on the side in regards to kind of enablement and consulting around culture. And um, you've kind of experienced some of these things firsthand and how culture can really kind of make or break a, a company, but we'll focus on like a sales, the sales org of a company today. Um, tell us a little bit about that and, and maybe why you decided to kind of pursue this side hustle of yours. Uh, I, I discovered over, over the course of my career that, that culture is the single most important thing to drive sales success and to build a high performance team. It's really, it starts with culture. And what I notice is I've been really lucky to work with like some of the world's elite sales leaders. I mean, people that crushed the quota, not just hit quota, but like crushed it. And I, I would notice in my enablement sessions, a lot of times, especially when I would train managers, you know, I would always say, Hey, is there anything else you guys want to talk about in addition to the agenda day? And over and over and over again, people would say, Hey, how do we motivate our teams? How do we get our teams motivated? We want to talk about that. And so I started thinking about that and giving a lot of thought to, you know, of course, initially I was just giving kind of the same BS answers that you always get. Well, you know, Make sure you're listening to them. Make sure they have a voice, you know, and it's not that that stuff isn't, isn't true, but it's just so, you know, old and tired and generic. I mean, we all know that you can get on LinkedIn and just read post after post of people saying, you know, people don't leave their company. They leave their boss. And, you know, that kind of, let's just like drivel. <laughs> it's, it's not enlightening anymore. Right. We've yeah. all heard that, but I, I initially started with that, but then I started digging deeper and started reading a lot of books on motivation and watching like the world's best motivational speakers and listening to podcasts and all this. And then thinking back through the, the sales leaders that I saw that were successful and what they were doing that was different, you know, than maybe like a mediocre sales manager, you know, these elite sales leaders, what were they doing that was different? And they were getting very intentional about the kind of culture they were building. And they started with this kind of foundational principle. I call it never motivate. Uh, and it's very, it's very contrary to what we're taught as sales managers and, and people in sales. You know, I, I say, why would, why would my job be to get people pumped up to do something I'm already paying them to do? And that's where this never motivate concept comes from. And we think of like what you're doing there at abstract, Greg, you know, you might have a great team with you and I'm sure you do. I've met some of your team already and they're top notch. You might have a great product. You might have great, a uh, great spouse. You might have a great former boss, whatever, but ultimately like in those, those late nights when you're trying to accomplish the vision, and really anything that we've ever, any of us are proud of that we've accomplished in our careers or our personal lives, who did that? Well, the answer for all of us is I did that. You did that, right? Like you had people to support you, but ultimately to accomplish something great that we're really proud of, we have to look inside of ourselves and find that self-motivation, right? We can't expect others to get us pumped up to accomplish something great. It's just not going to happen. But yet sales managers spend so much time, and this is one of the key differentiators between a sales manager and a sales leader for me. Sales managers spend so much time trying to get people hyped, right, to do this sales role instead of creating an environment and a culture where self-motivation, self-motivation is expected, incentivized, encouraged, celebrated, every day. And I, as the sales leader, will give you the tools, the resources, the support you need to do that, right? But you, your part of the agreement is you're going to bring your A game every day. If you don't want to do that, that's fine. We can go have a beer and be friends, but you're not going to be on my sales team, right? And setting that expectation up front with people. And that's what I saw. And, and leaders that were able to build that intentional culture with that foundational principle, that's, that was kind of like the first thing that I unlocked, uh, and I thought, man, like the light went off in my head. And I started sharing that message with, with, uh, with my sales managers and at conferences and stuff. I do a, a talk called never motivate. Right. And I started sharing that with people and they're like, whoa, like, I think we all know this intuitively. We, we all know that this is true, but we like to play this little stupid manager game where 
you know, hey, come on, everybody. And it's not to say that you don't recognize people for great things. That's part of a great culture. It's not to say that you don't do spiffs and have fun. That's part of a great culture too. It's when we expect things that are that are temporary, which is really inspiration. That's what we're capable of is inspiring people temporarily. And when you inspire somebody, basically what you're doing is you're helping them imagine something, doing something great, right? But that's very temporary. And that's really all we're capable of to really truly motivate somebody. We just don't have the ability to create that in some inside of somebody else. If you think of motivation, you define that as, as people actually having a drive inside of themselves to accomplish something great, not to just imagine it and give them the warm and fuzzies and feel good, but really to do something to execute that comes from within plugged into the right kind of culture. Uh, so that's a long answer to your question, but what I'm doing now is I'm focusing on with my team at acoustic. And then I really would like to work with more and more startups, establishing that up front. It's so much easier to establish the kind of culture you want up front because culture is going to happen anytime you get people together. The difference is, you know, do you want an accidental culture or do you want an intentional culture? And I work with leaders to build intentional cultures where they outline, this is what we're trying to accomplish. These are the things we're going to do to get there. This is the way in, the, in which we're going to execute. And if you want to be part of that, awesome. If you don't, that's okay too, but you can't work here. Um, and so that's uh, that's what I've, what I've learned really from, you know, the best sales leaders on the planet in my career. And I'm just trying to spread that message to others. Well, I think um, you just gave us enough to, for the entire podcast. So we're done. Today. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing left to talk about. <laughs> um, so this morning, um, I was listening to you. So do you know who David Goggins is, Sean? Yeah, yeah. He's so, the guy like, I, your feet are bleeding, keep running, that guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, he talks about this 19-hour race that he did. And um, he uh, was sitting in a, an ice tub after. And he, uh, his mom called him and was like, you need to go to the hospital. And he's like, yeah, I know I need to go to the hospital, but I'm going to just sit here and enjoy this pain for a second because I just accomplished something that no one said I could ever do. Yeah. And it just makes me realize there's such a difference between motivation versus inspiration. I love inspiration is fleeting. Inspiration falls apart the moment adversity strikes motivation allows you to keep going. And I ultimately think that that starts with, uh, starts with why Simon Sinek wrote a great book on start with why. Mm -hmm. And so when you build an intentional sales culture, um, you have to kind of start with that foundation. Like why are we bringing these people on board? And then why do they want to be a part of our team? Is it because yeah. they want to make a good salary? Great. They can go make a good salary anywhere. Um, do they want to cool, sell a cool product? Cool. They can go sell a cool product anywhere. Um, do they want a ping pong table? Like, is that what culture means to them? Great. You're not going to work here. Um, and so, so much of that, I would say, Sean, and please feel free to disagree with me, starts with how do you identify cultural fit in the interview process mm. so that you're building that intentional culture and not allowing it to be accidental by, by allowing people to bypass or kind of fake their way through the interview process and yeah. accidentally land up on your team? Uh, I think that's a great question. I would back up just a little bit though. And I would start at the beginning. I would say most sales managers uh, that aspire to be sales leaders. And if you define, you kind of see a pattern here with me, right? Like I like to define words, I get into semantics, but I feel like the more you can define the word, the more action you can take on it. Yeah. So it's not to say that these are black and white definitions and they're absolutely hundred percent true in every case, but I like to almost present them that way because it helps me helps me make sense of the thoughts and take action faster. If you think of a manager as somebody who mainly monitors and measures and reports things that have already happened, like they're very reactive, right? It's not that that's bad. It's important. That's an important uh, skill. But the truth of the matter is most people can learn how to do that. It's basically like you as my boss, if you're my VP of sales, you teach me how to read uh, read the report or submit the report you want. You teach me how you like me to forecast and Almost anybody can do that. Whereas a leader is, is a more of a visionary, obviously. Like they're saying, okay, here's what we're going to do. Here's the things we need to do to get there. Here's the way we're going to do it. And it's moving forward. It's working in the present. So to answer your question is like, how do you interview for, for, for culture fit? I would say you have to know exactly what kind of culture you're building. And most sales managers don't know that. Most, hell, most VPs don't know that. They've never sat down and thought about 
what kind of culture am I trying to build? If you ask them something like that, they'll give you some, some kind of adjectives. Usually they'll say something like, well, I want it to be fun. I want it to be inclusive. I want it to be competitive. That's great. Those are components, but you got it. I walk people through an exercise where we define their vision, mission, and values. And I have them write it out and really give some thought to it. But people are challenged even with this buzzword world we live in. People are challenged even with just discerning between what's the difference between a vision and a mission, right? I've seen companies, corporate HR run out, roll out something and call it their vision. It's really a mission. Like we, we really just throw these terms around and we really don't understand them. If you think about a vision, you define it this way. The vision is where you want to go or what you want to be known for. So if I'm working with a sales manager or even a director or VP of sales, I say, okay, uh, imagine that you're going to be leading this team for the next three to five years. And according to statistics, if you're at a sales manager level or director level, that's probably the case, especially in tech. You're going to lead them for three to five years, and then they're going to move on or you're going to move on. You're going to get promoted. You might go to a different company, what have you, right? So this isn't like my lifelong vision, like my legacy, but it's also not, you know, next year. So a vision is not to go to President's Club or to get everybody to the circle of excellence. That's a goal, right? A vision has to be something aspirational, almost like so big that it kind of sounds crazy that you even think you can do it, right? Because that's what people are going to get excited about. That's what they're going to want to get on board with. It isn't freaking hitting quota. That's not a vision. That may be a goal. That should only be a goal for, you know, the next two quarters after we do it, then we should stop talking about quota and move on to, you know, bigger and bigger numbers and, and, and stretch ourselves. But I digress. Vision is where you want to go or what you want to be known for at the end of your time leading this team. Mission then is what actions or how are you going to get there? What actions do you need to take or how are you going to get to this destination, the vision? And then the values, which is what a lot of leaders think about when they think about culture, they start rattling off these values or adjectives is in what way are you going to execute the mission to achieve the vision? So I walk them through this whole exercise and we get really down, you know, in the nitty gritty and really look at exactly what do you want? Once we have that established, then this becomes their North Star for building their culture. So then when I interview somebody, I know I'm looking, one of my values is self-motivated. Right. So when I'm interviewing somebody, now I'm going to say, hey, Greg, tell me about a time where you had to dig down deep inside of yourself to find the motivation to complete a really difficult task or project. Yep. Right. So that's yeah. how. I, but if you don't know, if you don't know what you're aiming for, then, the, you know, Zig Ziglar said this, you know, if you aim for nothing, you'll hit it every time. And the same goes true for interviewing. We go into interviews and we just look for people basically that are cool or that are like us or say some of the things like, hey, do you like to work on a team and work hard? Oh, yeah. OK, great. Boom. You're hired. Right. Can you show me a, a quarter or two of performance that may be real, maybe not be real? Great. You're hired. Instead of saying, here's my vision, mission, values, here's the culture. And what our team's been doing here at Acoustic is they're using that to hire and they're sharing their vision, mission, values with potential candidates and engaging reactions and responses to that. And we've got a lot of positive feedback, actually, because, you know, we're all looking for the rock star reps, right? So you kind of get in a mode where you're trying to convince them to come work for you at the same time that they're trying to convince you that they want to, you know, that you should hire them. And so they've been using that and we've been really successful with that. And they've said, hey, we, you know, we haven't seen this anywhere where somebody, somebody has their vision, mission, values lined out and they present that to us in the interview. The last thing I'll say about this is it sets the expectation right from the beginning too, of, hey, I don't know if you're looking for a professional cheerleader, but I, I hung up my pom-poms a long time ago. That's not what you're going to get from me. From me, you're going to get support, coaching, the tools and resources you need. But from you, my expectation is that you bring your A game every day because I'm not going to get you pumped up to do a job I already hired you to do. Like that's part of the partnership, right? That's the agreement. Uh, so that's the, again, I'm really good at giving long answers. And I, I guess it's just because I, I can't give these like little two line answers to these big, big issues, but that's yeah. how in interviewing, I would begin to suss out, is this person going to be a cultural fit? You got to start at the beginning, which is defining your vision, mission values. I love that. So one of my favorite interview questions is tell me about a time you failed and how you overcame it. And if you can't answer that question, if you ever never, if you've never experienced failure before, I don't want you on my team because you haven't built up the calluses to be able to push through tough times. Yeah. And then the second question I ask people is, you know, what's the most pain you've ever been in and how did you deal with it? And if you've never 
been in pain before, you've never felt pain, like you have no business. I don't, I don't want you on our team because mm. being in, you know, a start, startup, software startup, like there's more bad days than good days. Like, especially for the first couple of years. And like, I need to know you've hardened yourself. I need to know that you have built up the calluses, the mental strength, the emotional dexterity to push through crappy situations. If you're able to prove to me that you can do that, I know you can go find a way to hit quota. Like yeah. that becomes secondary to me because yeah. I know that like, you know how to persevere through tough times. And like, that's, again, again, it aligns to you kind of the, the vision that we have for abstract and the mission. And that kind of permeates down through the people that we want to hire and the people we have hired. So I'm right on board with that. I know that's uh, tough for some people to swallow, Sean, and it might not be the most popular opinion on things. And it's easier to kind of take sound bites from, you know, LinkedIn posts about what kind of interview questions we should be asking, but it, it's no wonder why 50% of sales teams fail and attrition rate on sales teams is so high. It's because you're not getting down to the nitty gritty of what you should be asking for in the interview process to bring those people mm. into your intentional sales culture in the first place. Yeah. And, and what I think is interesting is that sales, I think most sales managers expect what you just said, but they don't outline it. They don't ask a great question like you did uh, to really suss that out. But then also, they're not telling them what what the end game is. They're not casting a vision. It's just like, come on, you know, I know this is tough. Grind, hustle, try harder, sell more, do better. But that's it's so you know fugazi. It's like up in the atmosphere. We don't know what that really means, right? Yeah. But when you define the vision, mission, values, I always I'm going to go back to that. When you define that up up front, now I have something to point to. So when things are going shitty, then I can say to my team, "Hey guys, I know it's tough right now. Remember, our vision is to be the leader in this industry. Is to be the number one solution for call coaching or whatever the vision is. Right? Uh, our our dream is to be the number one team in North America. Our dream is to be the number one team globally." you know, at this company in sales, whatever it is, you, you drive them back to the vision. You say, Hey, don't forget, we're on our way there. We're making progress. It sucks. You know, we're gonna have to take some pit stops sometimes, but we're making progress. If you don't have that to point to, then people are just like, what, are, why are we even doing this? And then some recruiter comes along and says, Hey, over here, it's perfect. It's amazing. And we do have ping pong tables and free drinks, all you want snacks, everything, you know, come and sit in our massage chair. We have an amazing culture. And then they're going to, you're going to lose them, right? Yeah. Because you're not yeah. painting the picture of the future. So let's do, let's dive into something a little bit more um, tactical. Like how do we apply this? So this is easy to do at a smaller organization. This becomes increasingly more challenging as you're adding in a VP level, a director level, a manager level, mm -hmm. um, maybe a team leader level type of thing. How do you work with a company to ensure that what's in the CEO's mind, the CRO's mind in terms of the vision and the, the vision and mission, I just combined those two and made up my own word. Um, how do you get that to permeate down all the way to that frontline SDR who is working at home mm -hmm. a thousand miles away from their leader and probably couldn't even tell you who the CEO of the company was. This is, this is why I like working with startups because you're right. It is easier. It's almost more possible to do what we're talking about <laughs> because, yep. you know, if I was working with abstract, you know, I'm going to meet with you, right? You're, you're the, you're the guy. And then if you were to hire a director or a VP, then you would have already cast your vision, mission values. And then that VP then plugs up into that. He has to, or she has to make sure that her vision, mission, values aligns with yours. It's not that it's going to, it's not that it can't be a little different because let's face it, if you and I were both selling at the same company, we're both frontline sales managers, it's going to be different to be on team Refner than on team Buxton. We could be selling the exact same thing. We're both super cool dudes, right? But our cultures are going to be a little different because the values are a little different and that's okay. It really happens mostly in the values. But as long as my values don't contradict my boss's values, then we're all good. It just makes us different, 
right? But if my boss's value is teamwork and my boss and my values are, you know, uh, whatever it takes, be a lone wolf, that's cool by us, you know, just, just hit your number. That's when you start having, they start Clash. bumping into each other. Yeah. yeah, but you're right. I mean, it's it's not easy. And if the CEO isn't bought into it, and especially if like your CRO isn't bought into it, I would even say like the CRO, you know, maybe the CEO doesn't have to be bought into it because he or she's thinking about your company culture, right? And and those those values are good, but let's face it. I mean, they're not super meaningful to an SDR or an AE because they're not sales driven. They're largely around like everybody getting along, everybody listening to each other. Again, nothing wrong with those. But I'm trying to manage a team of sales killers here, right? They're not so excited about, you know, empathy. They, they maybe are for their customer, right? But the, they don't care if HR understands them or not. They, they're here to make some freaking money, right? And to sell, to do it ethically, but to, but to sell, right? So that's just a different, that's why I only work with sales organizations. <laughs> like I don't, I don't do leadership training for uh, HR or for finance or accounting or like, because we just don't even speak the same language. They think I'm a weirdo. But if we're talking sales and we're driving performance, that CRO's vision, mission, values, if he or she sets that, then your your VP comes under, he or she sets theirs so that it plugs up into there and director and sales manager. Um, some people, I've heard some people are like, especially up high, this is a new kind of concept for them. And so senior leaders get kind of nervous because they're like, well, you know, then they're not going to be able to re. re- they're not going to know what our vision is, uh, you know, the company vision. They're not going to know what our values are because we're going to get them all confused with all these different. And my answer to them is they don't know that anyway. Like, you, I know you did that one. I know you did that one hour webinar and you thought it was really great. Um, half of them weren't there and the other half weren't listening. They were checking their email during it. And they you can go up to them at any SKO. They're not going to be able to tell you what your freaking values are of your company. But you know what? The, where they live every day and what you care about, which is them selling, and to your point, as people are remote, them feeling like they're part of something other than their, you know, kitchen table, that they do know about. That message comes to them frequently from their manager. That comes from the director. They do. They are able to say, my team vision is to be number one in North America. Our values are drive in, uh, you know, whatever, whatever values you want to come up with, right? Innovation, discipline, whatever. It could be anything. So, yeah. Uh, it's not easy. It's not easy. And that's why most people don't do it. Most people just would rather be like, they would just rather talk about culture and we have a great culture. And, uh, you know, that's about as far as it goes. So I know you don't like working with other parts of the, uh, a company, but what's been always interesting for me being in sales is it, um, when leader of a company gets up there and touts, you know, here's what we're going to do and we're all going to perform. And then in sales, I feel like everybody else is kind of allowed to not do their job. Well, like products allowed to miss deadlines. Um, Customer success is allowed to lose customers. Marketing is allowed to not hit their number. Um, HR is allowed to not hit their, you know, happiness score or whatever. (laughs) The sales team, you know, if you miss your number, right? Like you're screwed. I feel like you, if you're going to take that approach and align, like you can't contradict yourself. You can't be hypocritical. If you're going to be a leader of a company, like the, that the culture you establish has to permeate through every part of your organization or sales will start kind of going like, well, they're not doing what they're supposed to do. Like how important is that? Right. Have you ever Mm -hmm. seen, like I've experienced that Maybe I've just kind of lived in a bubble in my experience, but have you ever kind of experienced that kind of holding sales to maybe a different standard than other parts of the company? Only every place I've ever worked in sales, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, it kind of comes to the territory, I think. Um, I think that that happens not for malicious reasons normally, but because I think it's so hard to measure what a lot of these other departments do. And I'm, I'm not trying to, to talk bad on them. Obviously I love sales and I think it's the best. That's why I'm in sales. Uh, but that being said, I think it's hard to met, you know, like you were struggling to come up with an example of how you measure HR, You're like happiness score. What the, <laughs> what the hell is that? Right. That's what I love about sales is you can look at the scoreboard and say, okay, we won or we lost. Right. Yeah. We, yeah, we it's numbers. Yeah. It's numbers. Right. And so that's the beauty. And uh, also at the same time, the, 
the hardest part about sales is that you are constantly being watched and measured. I think what's important is, you know, we talk, I, I have a program I put my sales leaders through called the sales leader Trident. And, and part of that is uh, the third part is overcoming obstacles for performance is the third area we focus on. And the concept behind that is we want our sellers laser focused on what they're there to do, which is to sell, right? Don't get caught up in all this drama. The obstacles that are that are in front of us that we can control are usually breakdowns in communication uh, amongst the team, amongst us and other departments, things like that. I think the danger comes when we let them get focused on things that are beyond the control, even many times the frontline manager, right? And if you're if you're held by private equity or if you're a public company, you know, it's beyond even sometimes the VPs. Uh, sphere of control. And so in that part of the uh, the training, we talk about, hey, let's focus on what we can control, what we can measure, which is driving sales. We know that if you're scared that you're getting acquired and you're going to lose your job, there's one good way to make it look like you shouldn't lose your job. And that's to crush your number. You know, if uh, if we're going public and you're worried about the, the best the answer is to crush your number, that's always the best answer in sales is to focus on what you can control, which is the number. And then the role of the manager then is to go and to advocate for his or her team and, and, you know, to try to even the playing field like that. But I, you know, I wish I had a great answer for you. I've seen it a lot. I kind of think it just comes with the territory. Yeah, that's fair. You have to, I mean, you have to know what you're getting yourself into in the world yeah. of sales, right? Like you're only as good as your, your previous, as good as yesterday. What, what did you do for me yesterday? And as soon as you own that and use that to motivate you. Um, like, I think that's one of the best part about sales is you kind of control your own destiny. Like there's not a lot of jobs out there in the world where you can be a top 1% income earner at a very early age yeah, and also dictate whether you have a job tomorrow or not. Yeah, Like it is, <clears throat> I think it's exciting, right? I think, uh, and for the right people that we would want to have on as part of our intentional culture, they're going to want, they're going to see that as exciting too. And they're not going to see that as risk or, um, you know, potentially use that as something to, to scare them away. So. Yeah. So, I mean, I think sales is the greatest profession in the world. If you can sell, you always have a job it may not be at the company you want or selling the product you want, but that skill by itself uh, is the most powerful skill I think that you can have. Yeah. That's why I love yeah. teaching people how to do it better. That's why I love doing it myself uh, because it's just so powerful. And to your point, I mean, it's such an amazing opportunity to be able to sit now at your kitchen table, right? With a headset and talk to people all over the world and make, you know, 200 grand, 300, who knows as much as you want. Right. And you're sitting there and you're freaking 20, 25 years old. Yeah. It's amazing. It's an amazing opportunity. Uh, that's why at our company and, uh, I think any company that is is wanting to be successful consistently, not just get lucky. Um, that's why they need to communicate that with with candidates, the expectation, you know, and set that standard of excellence through yeah. the culture. I love it. Well, we didn't get to nearly almost all of our questions that we had planned, Sean. Um, Sorry about so, that. I feel but, like that uh, is my fault. <laughs> no, it was good. We, uh, I, I love it when these conversations just organically kind of diverge into different topics, but um, kind of wrap things up. If you know anybody wants to get a hold of you, learn more about what you do and potentially explore working with you, what's the best way to do that, Sean? You can go to seanbuxton.com and uh, there's contact form there. You can see some of the things I like to talk about, but it's mainly around building high performance cultures, building a consistently high performance culture, not you know just getting lucky every once in a while because you inherited a good culture. Yeah. But how do you keep that culture and use it to drive performance quarter after quarter after quarter? And again, the beauty of everything that I talk about is I've just kind of consolidated it, right? These aren't, these aren't my own ideas. These are from the world's best elite sales leaders. And you can go and listen to one sales trainer and he, and hear what he or she thinks about everything. And, and it might be spot on. What I do is I take, you know, 20 to 30 different leaders I've worked with and the common thread throughout all of them. And I share that with people, I consolidate it and, and it works. You know, the proof is in the pudding. Uh, not everybody's got the stomach for it, but if you wanna be a high performing team and you're self-motivated, then it works. I've seen it work over and over. So would love to work with anybody. And then in addition, you know, check out Acoustic uh, for all your digital marketing. 
uh, needs were there for you as well. And uh, don't forget abstract. You know, that's what I read. I really like what you guys are doing. I, I read, uh, I was reading one of your blogs, I think, and just talking about how in the past call recording and those kinds of tools were very reactive and how your technology allows us to be proactive and in the moment to take advantage of our opportunities. And I think that's going to be something that is really going to change the landscape. So excited to see what you guys continue to do there. Cool. Well, we appreciate it, Sean. And uh, thank you for sharing your words of wisdom and um, yeah, enjoy the rest of your day. And I think, uh, I think our biggest challenge is going to be coming up with what the title of this podcast, because there were so many good takeaways, Sean. So thank you. All right. <laughs> Thanks for Bye. having me. Bye. Bye. Bye.